dear guests, professors, alumni, DBA, and MBA students, Sleska corporate partners, who are all branded as a Sleska family, as this is the spirit and the culture that Sleska management had spread among us all for over 23 years. On behalf of Sleska management, academicians, and administration, we welcome you all to such a unique webinar to be run by such a unique honorary guest speaker, Dr. Mahmoud Mohideen, who is joining us live from Washington, DC. This is the first of a series of webina webinars, and we are truly honored to have Dr. Mohideen as our first honorary speaker. The webinar is about on dealing with challenges and implications of the global, great global crisis. And let me show you, this is what we will be covering today. My name is Dr. Hisham Sadek. I will be your moderator tonight. The total number of registration for this event till a year, uh, an hour ago was over 2,000, covering more than 15 different countries. Before we begin, and after the permission of Sleska management, I would like very much to express my appreciation and gratitude to the IT team and the administration team of Sleska, led and orchestrated by Mr. Karim Al Hanawi, the executive director of Sleska Egypt, to get this to get this event done in less than 72 hours. And special thanks go to Dr. Mohideen's team in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Mohideen has such a rich CV that I had to spread it over three slides. And this is after I had shortened it. But you will not see these slides. Dr. Mohideen wants to be able to speak to you freely as an esteemed Egyptian economist. Regarding webinars, webinars may be a new experience for most of us but it is worth trying. Just by listening to me now, you are already there in an online real-time session and actually you'll be participating. Sleska is targeting to spread the idea of investing during crisis. And this is exactly what this webinar is all about, to invite your press to invest your precious time while sitting at home due to the current situation. As an important request to all of you, please kindly note down your questions on a sheet of paper or use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your screen. And after Dr. Mohideen completes his presentation, the floor will be open for questions. We will begin with the pre-sent questions. Then we will take the live questions from the webinar attendees using the Q&A feature which will depend very much on the time that Dr. Mohideen will be given us, subject to his high and tight schedule. So, dear guests, uh, uh, please enjoy the Sleska's first webinar. This is our agenda. After I finish the introduction, Dr. Mohideen will start uh, his lecture. Uh, but then we're going to answer, this is going to be for half an hour. Then we will be, uh, Dr. Mohideen will be answering the present questions. There were over 20 questions that, were, that we received, and uh, they were consolidated to 16. Well, they were consolidated, not for anything, but just to tell you that uh, there are questions that were repeated, or they were in the same uh, domain. So all the, all the questions were reviewed well. And then after this, uh, we're gonna, Dr. Mohideen will answer the questions from the audience while, while they're using their uh, Q&A, uh, and if, if we have time. And then at the very end, we'll be wrapping up and, and ending the whole, uh, the whole uh, conference. Dr. Mohideen is the renowned Egyptian economist and professor of economics and finance, Faculty of Economics and Political Science, Cairo University. Ladies and gentlemen, please, Dr. Mahmoud Mohideen.
Right. Um, good afternoon and um, good evening. Assalamu alaikum to you all. I wish you all to be in the best of health. And I'm happy to join uh, this experiment, I would say. This is the first time I do it, I do it this way, given the, um, um, the challenges. I would have wished to be uh, with you all in person. But uh, let's see how this kind of um, a very remote uh, social distancing is going to be um, uh, facilitated through um, uh, technology and uh, technological advances. So uh, it's a presentation that is um, based on a PowerPoint. I hope it will be uh, shared. I don't know if it's shared or not, but um, I'll be working uh, on two ways of handling it. Verbally through a discussion that may not really be fully related to, uh, to the PowerPoint and uh, waiting for your uh, discussions um, as well. The screen is not sharing. I got a message. Um, so we'll see how it, uh, how it will get to work now. Yes, so the presentation is loaded now. It will be a bit slow on some of your screens, so be patient. And I can start now by just uh, giving you some sort of a, an introduction um, of why I chose this, uh, this title that may not really uh, stand the test of history. So uh, I chose this um, title on dealing with the challenges and implications of the great uh, global uh, crisis. Uh, but for history that isn't uh, a very uh, memorable, descriptive, or even symbolic name, it remains to be seen how long and deep it will be, I mean, this crisis. So later a name may evolve. Um, it is, however, the first economically significant pandemic since the Spanish flu in uh, 2018. And uh, this is unfortunate uh, name for the Spanish um, um, flu. It has nothing to do with Spain as origin of it, but it was first discovered there. Um, however, it's the first time as well that people will become aware of economic, monetary, fiscal uh, consequences of pandemics. It is global, it is an economic crisis, and more importantly, it's a human and humanitarian crisis. So it is great in that, in that sense. I recall after graduation uh, from college um, at Cairo University in 1986, a few months after I witnessed um, the Black Monday uh, crisis. Nothing to be compared with the kind of scale that we are having today. It's kind of... Uh, um, a game for kids if you are comparing it to the compounded impact of the current crisis. Then 1997, the emerging markets financial crisis, again, not to be compared at all with the scale or impact of this uh, global crisis. Then, of course, the uh, global financial crisis of 2008 that had repercussions that were still suffering from it until this moment. So if I tell you that much smaller crises had these kind of big significant impacts on people for more than a decade, like the global financial crisis, just imagine what kind of transformational uh, change, positive and negative, I would say negative and positive, depending on how you are going to be perceiving it, on the life of people, their way of handling matters, economic activities, and social impact. So let's go through this um, uh, PowerPoint presentation that is being prepared and updated actually until the last minute because a few minutes ago, I had to include in it the uh, G20 meeting that just finished uh, a couple of hours ago. 
the G20 uh, emergency meeting, which was hosted by the uh, 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 Saudis as their host. Um, um, as you know, the G20 has a chair each year, and this year it's the, um, uh, the round that is shared by uh, Saudi Arabia. So they had um, a meeting um, today at the level of the heads of state. So let me go through this outline. I'll be tackling the mega trends in the world, and this is very important. Don't forget that this is a very big shock to the system, but there are other matters that have been in play even before this crisis. And actually I included um, in past presentations in the US, in Europe, in China, in uh, Egypt, in other parts of the world, what I called mega trends and disruptive um, um, uh, forces. Then I'll tell you something, given that we are all learning and studying. Every year, there are some good models assessing and forecasting what could be happening in the following year. And this year, 2020, is no different. There were many um, um, uh, forecasts based on models um, talking about what will be the future in 2020. You'll be surprised that uh, almost none of what was feared or what was accepted as a good development had been reflected in the first three months um, of this year. I'll talk as well about the underlying conditions of the economy and the financial market. And then I'll uh, go through a very important slide because it has to do with the kind of policy implications at the government level, at the private sector, and equally, if not more important, at the community and, and at the uh, family or household level. Then I'll uh, share some reflections on the G20. Um, emergency summit, and then some imagination, um, perhaps wild, about the post-COVID-19 world. I have to add 19 there, yeah. Okay, so let's see the following slide. I'm, uh, I'm assisted by uh, my colleague here, Rami, who worked hard to finish this uh, presentation. So uh, the global uh, megatrends, of course, you will focus on the one at the bottom, pandemics and uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases. These have been a threat for many, many years. Uh, some of you may, uh, would remember the SARS. Uh, some of you would remember the, the challenges related to uh, Ebola crisis. Um, varieties of uh, challenges in epidemics and pandemics uh, during the last uh, few years. Did we learn from these? crises? No, we did not. Although that the Ebola crisis, which was the most recent of them, lasted in three African countries between 2014 and 2016. And actually a fourth African country, which is DRC, or the Democratic Republic of Congo, just had been at it until very recently when they declared that they have no more infections. But I like really you to um, share with me some sort of understanding and thinking about other mega trends that are happening at the same time. There are severe demographic changes, fast urbanization, climate change with its impact negative, especially in the coastal areas and small islands, farming um, and other uh, economic activities. We have market volatility, ups and downs in commodities and commodity cycles, even before the current crisis. We, ha we have been suffering from fragility and violence uh, in many countries around the world, including uh, many uh, African countries. Yemen was suffering from problems until very recently, still in the middle of a crisis. We have seen what is happening around the world in many, many countries in the Middle East, Africa, and some parts of the world, including um, uh, Myanmar, for instance. And we have some tensions elsewhere in Latin America put that into consideration. Many of you and I followed as well this kind of debate about the fourth industrial revolution and its impact, um, the technological changes. And then there is a line there, uh, or actually the two on, in blue, about the shifts in global economy and the controversy about globalization, which I'll keep 
until the very end, because this is about the post-COVID-19 kind of world. Next, please. So let's see how those good people who are trying to anticipate risks before the global crisis that we're in today, what they were estimating for us. These were basically uh, presentation that were shared at the end of 2019 in the normal season of sharing updates uh, on uh, opportunities and risks for the following year. So this one, for instance, came from AXA, uh, which is a very serious insurance company, and they did their best in order to understand what could be the kind of risks uh, facing them. Climate change, cybersecurity, geopolitical instability, all of these problems, including artificial intelligence, uh, natural resource, um, mismanagement, pollution, and then pandemics came as number eight of risks. So it was there, but it's not number one, not number two, not even in the top five. Another, another attempt by another uh, group, uh, by the, I think by the World Economic Forum. Yeah. You look at the infectious diseases. Again, climate was number one. Matters related to biodiversity, issues related to uh, uh, water crises, um, weather problems, um, information infrastructure and cybersecurity. And where is the disease and infectious disease and pandemics? It's number 10. So you can tell you here, this is a lesson for the future. Regardless of the kind of sophistication of models and people, models and forecasts are about some guess about the future, educated guesses about the future. You need to be guided by them perhaps, perhaps, but you need not to believe in them too much. You need really to have some sort of uh, bigger and wider ways of anticipating uh, risks and opportunities uh, in the future. Next, please. So it's a compounded crisis, as I was trying to say. Um, grave global crisis, health dimension, economic conditions, and finance. These are the three areas that you need to work on. And the economic conditions are compounded with a social impact. As I said, we are not coming from a paradise. We are coming from a very weak, fragile situation economically and from the health sector. Weak health systems and weak conditions and fragile and economic performance and very vulnerable financial markets. So these are the three crises that we're living in today. The health system was not really that good. Before the crisis, the economies were basically not in their best shape. Actually, this report of the bank by the Global Economic Prospects as a title by the World Bank has in some of its chapter chapters some uh, reference to um, um, fragility of the economy and its growth, and we need to handle it with care. And this very impressive report is called A World at Risk. It's all about what we're in today. It was basically a kind of a board of experts. Um, can I see this uh, report, please? Yeah, get to the report and then we'll come back to this one. This is just an update from WHO about the extent of the crisis that we're in. So that report, A World at Risk, is, the, is um, um, an outcome of the board on monitoring global preparedness. And this is a board that was formed after the Ebola crisis and to produce its first report that I'm sharing with you now. And it's telling you, I'm leaving that, with you to, uh, to reflect on, but it tells you the world needs to proactively establish the systems and engage as needed in order to detect and control potential disease outbreaks. And this report that came out just in September 2019, it says for too long we have allowed a cycle of panic and neglect when it comes to pandemics. Pandemics happen like Ebola and the uh, swan flu and other kinds of flu, H1N1. Um, um, and then people neglect. And then when they happen, they panic. As if we are, they are describing in September what we are living in today. Unfortunately, outbreaks hit lower resource communities. And that's why we are 
hoping and praying that these kind of uh, uh, fast transmission of the disease do, do not um, reach the uh, low resourced communities, especially in Africa and the Middle East and South Asia. So prevention is much more important here. Social distancing is very much important. Protective measures are very important. Uh, you can see what is happening in some advanced uh, economies uh, with better health systems, although that they may have neglected as well primary health care in the preparations of their systems. Because they haven't seen such a crisis since 1918, uh, after the First World War. I I'm not really justifying, but I'm just trying to interpret uh, the, uh, uh, the case. And then uh, this report says invest in health emergency preparedness. Uh, following slide, please. And then I'll go to the map after that. And they put several recommendations. And um, in those several recommendations, this is the first pillar of action. Some of them, perhaps, we may have passed the, the proper time because they are about preparation and preparedness. But some countries are in different stages in dealing with this crisis. Some of them are in the, in the top um, uh, priority for them now to deal with the perfect uh, storm. Other countries are still handling uh, the challenge. And uh, I'm going to, to go through all of their um, several recommendations, but they are um, there about coordination, cooperation, pr prioritize the health sector, give it more resources, uh, more partnerships between the public and the private sector, and how to uh, cooperate at four levels, local, national, regional, and global. You'll all see in all of these slides that coordination has to happen at all of these levels. Some of the levels, levels like the national one is very well known, but now we are discovering the importance of regional cooperation and the importance of community-based actions. Can I go back to the map, please? So this is the recommendation here. This is the, uh, the update. And uh, today, I think the Secretary General of the UN was mentioning uh, things about how fast and exponential the, um, the disease is. Um, and the how many weeks it took for the, 100, the first 100,000 cases of infection, how many days it took the, uh, the, the second 100, uh, 100, how many days less it took for the, uh, the third one, 100,000, and now it takes even less for the fourth 100,000. Fortunately, there are um, um, all of these cases of recovery, which gives people hope, but what will give the people more hope is what I'll be sharing in a uh, in few uh, slides after that when I talk about what is required for the health system. It's all about this vaccine to be available for all. This will make people call uh, the vaccine and the cure um, as approved by the WHO. Don't listen to anyone. Actually, as we speak, just a few minutes before I talk to you, there was in the, uh, in the news here, in national uh, um, radio, uh, there was a news about the, uh, the authorities here in the United States took action against somebody in California claiming that he has uh, the cure for the disease. And he put uh, to his 1.5 million and more followers on Instagram that uh, the, the, everybody can be cured and there will be millions and millions of dollars gained if this kind of investment um, is going to be shared by as many of his followers. So the, uh, we need to be careful here by many people are trying to declare uh, victory of discovery of a medicine or a cure. Everybody is keen to have it. Everybody is desperate to get it. Um, there are different people, including some government officials in some countries are saying, that there are some cure that they have uh, been thinking about, but it's all about what you can get from this authority. It's a health issue. It's WHO that we need to refer to. Not anybody, not any national authority. It has to be the WHO. Okay, let's skip that one. All right. Very quickly, I will not go through all of these uh, charts, just a demonstration of uh, what I, tell, I told you that this crisis hit the economic and social system while it was suffering from fragility and low growth. You can see the, the, the graphs on, on your slide there, like glo global growth is declining. There were some projections that in 2020, 21, 23, 
that there could be some recovery. I don't think that there will be any uh, recovery uh, for 2020. Um, um, all of the estimates I see around are basically telling us if you were projecting growth of 2.5% growth for the world, like uh, OECD, the Organization of Economic um, uh, Cooperation and Development, um, uh, forecasted for the economy to grow by around 2.5%. Now the projection is for 1.25. Any kind of a growth I have been seeing for across the countries, if you are um, projecting X, it is um, X minus 50% or minus 40% or minus 30% of what you projected for 2020. Of course, countries which have a fiscal year, which is not a calendar year, like uh, Egypt, for instance, which has the first six months um, in a good shape, it will suffer in the, in the next uh, um, quarter or the current quarter, the third quarter of the year, um, which is ending in this month. And then uh, we hope to see some signs of, uh, of recovery, but it's just the hope. Um, um, we don't need really to speculate too much. You saw the, the dangers of speculation. You need to hope for the best and prepare for the worst in this kind of condition. All of these slides that I'm sharing with you on trade, on growth, on per capita income growth have to be revised. Any model that you had um, been developing until say February um, uh, this year, you need really to revise it uh, again. It's a completely different world. There is post-corona as there is a pre-corona. Next, please. Uh, well, again, more slides of the confirmation of the, the, the system. And actually what I wanted to share with you here is basically about these kind of trade tensions that have been in the system that are not very helpful. The, um, uh, the slide in your um, uh, uh, left, uh, up left there, trade disputes um, and their increase and how much the deterioration of trade to GDP growth, the contribution of trade to GDP growth and uh, issues related to uh, uncertainty in, uh, in trade policies. So the conditions, again, the, these slides are confirming what I said about uh, very fragile and very weak economic performance before the crisis. Next, please. Uh, so I said health, economic and social, and I'll come to the social further. And then we have the vulnerability of the financial markets. This, um, those three slides came from the Financial Times of yesterday by, in an article by um, a, a very good uh, economist and uh, journalist, uh, Martin Wolf. So um, here you can really see the volatility and the deterioration of the commodity prices and uh, the emerging markets um, stock, stocks, how they tumbled during, during um, the last uh, few weeks from December. If you take that as your 100 um, uh, base point, and then you see the kind of uh, deterioration um, uh, from the crude oil to the MSCI Emerging Market Index to the S&P to the global uh, food and uh, beverage indices, all deteriorated as we have seen, but the major deterioration happened as you saw in the oil prices. And I'll come back to you. Some of you asked in the questions I saw about the pros and cons and benefits um, of uh, oil price decline. Uh, it, ne it needs to be judged um, if you are a, an, an oil exporting country or an oil uh, importing country and uh, the uh, and actually the other channels if you are say a case that you are an oil importing company net oil importing country so you will be gaining because of the decline of the price but again if your country is dependent on fdi from an oil exporting country or emerging um, um, uh, problems associated with uh, remittances from workers abroad, um, you need really to make your net calculations. Don't just make the simple calculations that, well, the barrel of oil came down to very low um, level, so the net gain is positive. It's not really that easy. I wish it was. Um, then you can see uh, that the investors um, uh, in, um, in, um, in emerging markets have been selling off both emerging markets equities and debt. So debt that have been 
um, uh, with more guarantees and support had been uh, very, very volatile um, as well with major decline. The global economy um, is moving into a slump, um, as um, uh, I've been um, saying that if you have any kind of growth forecast, you need really to, uh, to, to revive that. Some countries will have uh, major uh, contraction. This means that they will see some uh, uh, growth rates of negative. Possibilities of, uh, of recession uh, are high. People before um, uh, this month were talking about a V-shaped V -shaped recovery. So you have a sharp decline and then you have a sharp recovery. Some others were saying that it could be a U-shaped, like you can really have a kind of um, a decline, but it will be um, going up slowly. And then some people say, well, it could be an L-shaped, very uh, steep decline, and then you stay at the bottom for a while. Um, we'll, we'll see how it works. It's very hard to speculate. It's all about now the shock is happening as we speak. It's all about how people are going to be reacting uh, to that. People means government and uh, household sector and the private sector is not just government. Next, please. Yeah, getting close here then to um, our uh, region, the Middle East and uh, North Africa region, or say the Arab uh, region, um, again, without repetition, uh, suffering across uh, some of the countries, not all of them, of political disruptions, fragility and conflict, um, issues related to uh, too much of concentration in one or two sectors, especially in the oil expo uh, exporting countries. And then you have the plunging oil prices and uh, matters related to the tension in the oil sector, in, actually even before the current crisis, and issues related to uh, incentives uh, to the private sector. Next, please. Okay. You still remember, I hope, those mega trends I talked about, that it's not just the COVID-19. There are mega trends. Some of them are positive. Some of them are negative. So we need to prepare for them. Um, KPMG, um, um, for many years, they have been doing a kind of an, a readiness index um, on, on countries. To what extent the enterprise sector is capable on handling changes, positive or negative, to what extent governments are capable of, through their policies, regulations, uh, rule of law, um, uh, property rights uh, management, um, uh, security systems to handle the changes, and then to what extent the people and the civil society is capable of handling changes, positive or negative, positive or negative. And here, is the, this is the methodology or the areas of, uh, of, uh, of focus. Uh, let's see how the Arab countries um, did in this uh, preparedness index. You can see that uh, the top countries in the world in preparedness were uh, Switzerland, uh, not surprisingly Singapore, uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden. Um, but the Arab countries here that either you don't have available information or they are not on the top, at the top of um, the preparedness. So this is, I'm saying that because the current crisis and its aftermath is basically about variety of shocks to the system. So we need really, if you're not ready, you need really to accommodate that. You need to be more active, flexible, and agile. Uh, and whatever I have here at the left is basically the ranking of KPMG on, uh, on, um, on the country's readiness. Um, this movement. Next one. Yeah, so let's have a focus um, on, um, on what's happening in the region. And you can translate that. I appreciate and many thanks again um, for the great uh, organization uh, by Estreska and uh, uh, by Dr. Miligi and uh, Dr. Uh, um, uh, Sadiq and uh, Mr. Hinawi for uh, arranging this. Um, many countries are involved, so it's not just one country here. So, um, okay, globally, I mentioned what, have, what is the forecast and the revision for, uh, from OECD. Some other IFIs are doing the same. Some IFIs are doing the same. Then you have uh, independent uh, views by independent economists saying that recession is more likely. 
I told you about, it's more likely that it is uh, U, we hope for uh, L and we fear, uh, we hope for a U and we fear an L kind of a situation for growth recovery. ESQA, which is the uh, UN regional body um, uh, uh, covering the Arab countries, is saying the following, that there is um, uh, a loss of around 42 billion uh, in GDP. Um, some people would say that this is very con conservative. 42 billion across the Arab world. Some people would say that this is a very conservative uh, estimate. They say that it could be a loss of around 1.7 million jobs in 2020 uh, before the recovery. Incre increase of unemployment rate by around one percentage point. So if your unemployment rate, say it's 10, it will be 11.2 based on their uh, cases. But this is the average. Um, um, I think the unemployment rate across different countries need to be dealt with in a country specific measure. Each country has to come up with its own figure, but they, in their case, they say um, it's the overall unemployment rate. ILO has uh, estimates uh, across the globe of a loss of around 5.3 million people of their jobs or 24.7 million in the, uh, in the high case uh, scenario of a base of 188 million people um, unemployed. So if you say roughly 190 million people, um, we can add to that either 5% or 24%. You can say then about an additional increase of unemployment by roughly um, uh, 2% or around 12%. Again, some people say that this would be very conservative. It gives you some sort of indications of the kind of uh, very uh, wide range of uh, speculation. Some people are benchmarking their estimates based on the, the financial crisis, which resulted of an increase of unemployment by 22 million people. Um, so you can just see the reference here and the magnitude of the crisis and, um, and the, glo the global dimension of the crisis. And then you can say, well, if these estimates are about right or not. Um, Estimates aside um, um, on growth and employment, of course, there is a, a crisis in, uh, in, uh, in uh, education as well. Many of the students, many of the um, uh, pupils in schools and universities around the world um, are, um, are studying from home or trying to. Uh, this is almost half of the uh, population of learners around the world, 890 million uh, pupil and student are studying from uh, from home or trying to because it has a reliance on digital solution. Not everyone like us has this kind of access um, um, to uh, advanced communication. Next, please. On oil, uh, oil is a very big story in the region. I mentioned that already. Before the crisis, the IMF was warning the oil exporting countries that their fortunes are at risk within 15 years. And actually you can see here at the, le at the left that the, uh, the staff members of the IMF and their calculations were very much uh, generous about the, uh, the direction of, uh, of oil in the, um, uh, on the short term, because it was very much focused in an area of 35 to um, um, more than 65, if you see the very dark blue part here in the focus um, of the possibilities. Now we see um, um, uh, oil much less than that. Will it sustain this or not? It's all about the supply and demand, management of supply and uh, demand if the economy is going to be moving again. Um, and again, this issue of gain and loss, uh, you can see here what we are uh, facing. The loss to exporters is estimated um, uh, based on two different scenarios of around um, uh, 38.1 uh, billion. This is scenario um, uh, two. And then uh, there is a gain for the region for, um, uh, for those who are importing. And there, then there is, there is a kind of a gain to importers by uh, the difference between the loss to exporters to uh, the gain to importers. Again, scenarios, who knows how it will work. 
and this is again is not putting fully the uh, the, uh, the the second round effect which i talked about impact on trade impact on uh, fdi impact on remittances next please okay so this is your triangle that you need to uh, to deal with these problems health economic and social conditions and finance in this order finance financial markets yes they are um, uh, suffering they are volatile they lost a lot as i uh, shared with you based on this update from ft the financial times yesterday but they are not the core of the problem today so and that's why i'm trying to put and the most important slide is, is the one that is coming next but health is the first thing that actually the the, the, the following slide and the one after health needs the focus don't get distracted it's like somebody uh, um, a doctor who is facing three four uh, patients um, or three patients one with a kind of a deadly disease he has to attend to immediately the other one could deteriorate fast so he has to have as a second priority and the third is just being affected with what's happening at the health and the economic and social conditions my simple prescri prescription which has been common and actually the G20 today came out with the same kind of approach a couple of hours ago that health is your focus saving lives is your focus and then deal with the short-term repercussions negative repercussions social and economic and then the financial sector you need to make it intact and to help you recovering because you don't need um, a failure in the financial sector so this but it's all about design coordination and prioritization i feel all sympathy to the policymakers because everybody's demanding something but they need really to prioritize next so the, the first one and this is coming from the who web, website please refer to the main sources what are these guys are saying the experts in the field those have been dealing with pandemics that they need to uh, focus on testing on medical supplies in prioritizing research and development in order to have this covid 19 vaccine and drugs and to share knowledge and data about the experience in every country and this kind of knowledge and sharing has many levels it has very technical level medical level for the uh, for the uh, health uh, service uh, industry in your country to the experts to the doctors it has some knowledge sharing for the policy makers and it has this kind of common knowledge sharing about what kind of precautions you need to have from the social distancing to washing hands to um, uh, to keep away from any kind of issues um, of, of, of concern that you don't need to expose your health to other problems in order not to get in this this one there is a good list um it is in arabic it's in english i saw the uh, advertisements as well and people are making so songs some people are making even jokes but as far as the, uh, the 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 simple idea of knowledge sharing is there it's very much important so test medical supply and then the vaccine and knowledge i'm saying not then it's not priority there are different people working in parallel at the same time those who are developing the vaccine not are the guys who are uh, developing the testing equipment not the guys who are working on knowledge sharing so there are many armies working at the same time so don't take it as one two three in order you can just say simultaneously all of that is happening and that all requires what resources public finance private finance prioritization next please Next, please. Yeah, this is one of the busiest slides that I did ever in my life. Um, it, it is full of information and action. And if you want to go through it, that could really be a kind of a small booklet. But I'm saying the challenge or putting the challenge in red and the cure, given that we're in a health crisis, in green. And I put that in Arabic yesterday as well in, a, in an article uh, published in the uh, Sharq al Awsat newspaper. It was published as well in a variety of uh, Arabic newspapers yesterday and today. I don't have uh, 
a Facebook account or a Twitter account, but I have a LinkedIn account. I shared it on it as well. And please use LinkedIn account um, if you want to communicate with me uh, in the future as well. What I'm saying that first understand that this is not a financial crisis, not a banking crisis. So don't bring your um, old playbook of the old crisis and apply it tomorrow. And actually, this is a mistake that many countries have put themselves into by just saying, yeah, a crisis, let's use the same kind of uh, firefighting. If there is a fire in the system and the experts on firefighting can tell you, if this fire is caused by X, it has a kind of a different treatment. If it is by oil, it will have a different treatment. If it is by Y, it will have a different treatment. So you need really to deal with crises based on their causes, not just because of their outcomes. You, you go and see the screens red if you are trading in the market and say, well, ah, we saw that in 2008 or 97, let's do what we did. No, it is a completely different crisis. It needs a whole of nation approach. It needs a whole of government approach. It's not just ministers of finance and central bank governors. It needs everybody in the system. It needs, ah, it needs the SDGs that we neglected. It needs the Paris Agreement to be put as well because we don't need to sacrifice the future while we are very busy for very good reasons with the present. I mentioned health, but here there's something else about health. Um, Rami, my colleague, said, well, we mentioned health before. I told him, no, this is another thing related to health. The health that we talked about is the emergency to deal with COVID-19, with corona. The other health is SDG3, which is the Sustainable Development Goals. Everybody now is thinking, do I have a good health insurance? Do I have a good primary health care provider? Do, you, do we have universal health coverage in our country? This system, please, check SDG3. And that's why I'm saying each line of these SDG3 is like when you put the details and targets, it's like a few, uh, few items there. Invest in education knowledge and human capital. You'll see different people acting differently based on their education, their sophistication, their culture. Why Singapore and Korea are succeeding? Because they have this kind of a system of education that had their human capital much better than others. The discipline, the knowledge, the reaction um, uh, to, uh, to disasters and problems um, is much better in, in societies that take their education seriously especially in the age of digitalization. Um, and here I'm referring to SDG 4. This is the, the sustainable development goal number four that you need to consider in digitalization. I'm happy that during the last two weeks, I was telling Rami and uh, my family here that during the last few years, I got acquainted with many applications, including this one and others that I was not really um, uh, educated about using. And so, so far I'm still learning. Um, but this is the basic kind of learning. Many people are going to be in the development side of this. So their learning requirements will be uh, bigger. Then the fourth one is about focusing on economic stimulus. Uh, this is, ah, stimulus, I heard this word before. It's the financial crisis. No, this is a completely different way of doing it. And the, um, and the financial crisis, we did it through a sweeping um, action. I was part of this of the team that uh, supported the system back home in Egypt in 2008. And thanks God we had the 2004 to 2008 on the financial reform. But the 2008 was about a banking and a financial crisis. This one is not. It's about health crisis, economic crisis, and social crisis. So we need to prioritize economic policies. We need to uh, pay attention to the people and the business. People and the businesses. If the previous one was business and people and the financial sector. This one, people comes first. You need the cash transfers. You need to consider universal income in some countries. You need to have targeted support and bill out for the companies and corporations that are requiring some help and support. So reminding you of fighting poverty, SDG one, reminding you of inclusiveness and equality, which is SDG 10. And actually, just to pause here, in the future, it will be very hard really to move on without having a cash transfer system in countries and societies. It will be very hard to convince people to work in the private sector, um, kind of high risk kind of business or lines of business, unless 
they have good social um, uh, support. Um, public education needs to be good. Health needs to be good, to be good, and transport needs to be good. These are the public provisions. And then you need, to, in addition to that, you need to have cash transfer system, a kind of a critical minimum to cover the basic needs. Even if you are Mr. Rich in your society, you need to be enrolled because you could be rich today and you could be vulnerable tomorrow. So, and, and then when you pay your taxes, there will be deduct deductibles. So if you say, for instance, we will be giving every person in the country 1,000 Egyptian pounds, um, for instance, uh, just a figure. So you say, well, you give that to the poor and the rich. And then when you tax the rich, based on the new digital system, you tell Mr. Rich, thank you, you got from the system 1,000 pounds, that has to be deducted from you in addition to your taxes. For Mr. Poor, you tell her or him, you need to keep that and there are other provisions for you. But everybody, everybody has to be part of this new technology that can avail to you through digital transfers a minimum of support for your requirements. If the time comes, you just need to press a button and get it. If you don't need it, thank you, it will go back to the state. How is it going to be funded? There is a funding system, please refer, just type in your Google ILO universal income or World Bank universal income or universal income period and you will get many of the interesting proposals there. Then um, I'm saying something about economic policies, how they should be prioritized, social protection, health insurance, enrolling the informal sector, um, impact investing, and social solidarity. If you just type any of these, you get loads and loads of information about each one of these kind of approaches of development. You need really to master them for the future or perhaps at least the, the present time. Localized development and investment. I have been saying for many, many years, perhaps because I'm coming from a village and Kafra Shok, Kalyubeya, it's not Kalyubeya, it's not anymore um, a village. I, I, I was born there when it was a village, now it's a kind of a town or a city. Um, but you will realize that your sense of community and interaction with your, your neighbors, and whatever could be provided through your own community because we cannot really move around. So issues of community-based support, education, health, transport, um, uh, uh, management of waste, all of these things are coming from your local authorities. And you need really to provide more support to that. You need to invest in these kind of actions now and to consider the returns for the future. But, I know this kind of localization may uh, bring some tendencies not to be competitive or to, uh, or to be protectionist. We need really to, uh, to do that while we are enjoying competitiveness and competition. Accelerate digitalization. I'm connected with you now, thanks to the uh, uh, digital revolution. Uh, data systems, networks, and artificial intelligence. The name of the game, you need to partner with the private sector and the communities, it's SDG 17, which is about partnership. Here, two interesting uh, areas, and I think I'm answering some of the questions while I'm uh, speaking, so uh, Dr. Sada could appreciate that. Um, pay attention to losers, winners, and Corona profiteers. Will there be losers? Yes, we see losers around us, unfortunately, those who lost jobs, those who are in the tourism sector, those who are in the entertainment sector, those who are in the informal sector, those who are supporting all of these sectors that have been partially or fully closed because of the supply shock. It's a demand shock and a supply shock at the same time. Demand people are not consuming and supply because some of the administrative um, uh, rules for health and for quarantine had really to be applied. So this is affecting the supply side. Well, are there winners? I'll give you a, a, a list of winners. Perhaps you can detect them. Of course, there are winners for good reasons. Winners because they are needed today, so they will do more business. They are really taking huge risks, but those who are still working today are at least in relative terms maintaining their jobs and some of them are making some good income. I'm distinguishing between those winners and what I call Corona profiteers. 
those who smuggle, those who monopolize, those who manipulate the prices need to stop now. As we said in the past, after the wars or during the wars, that there were um, war profiteers, there are as well corona profiteers. And provisions need to be made now through governance, role of public policy, regulations, rule of law, all of the things related to SDG 16 need to be applied. This is the, uh, the goal about governance. The final one, and this is uh, critical, you may not realize it now, but please keep this presentation for future reference to challenge me with it, not to tell me that I'm right. I'm, I've been fixing this slide with uh, Rami, uh, and we changed many things as we did it uh, because of new information. So imagine in a few weeks' time, how would, will it look if you, are, if you still have it? Number nine is very, very important. Nothing is more permanent than the temporary. There are some measures that you have to make today and you take today, but you shouldn't really pre lose sight and forget about them because as we saw, actually in some countries, they still have some provisions that came out from the Second World War until this moment in very advanced economies, by the way. So we need really to make sure uh, using the legal term that you need to have sunset provision, that you need to have something like this kind of regulation only applies until the, this, these kind of circumstances are there. Next, please. I'll be very fast because I'm eager to listen to your questions. Next. Yeah, this is from the past. All of what I said before, I, uh, just in, in that last slide, I said it in Egypt in November 2019. I'm not claiming that I said things that are relevant in the past and the future and the present, but now we need really, um, um, we got some message about, about the, uh, the presentation. I hope it's, uh, it is ready there. Yeah, okay. So uh, slide 21, okay. It is working fine, thank you, okay. Um, so you need then the, the summary, yeah, the summary of all of these nine um, uh, elements plus one, which is about the emergency health support, invest in people, invest in resilience, social protection, climate and disaster, risk identification, invest in the infrastructure of the new definition of infrastructure. Infrastructure, the one that you use today, is not just roads and uh, air, airports are closed, uh, seaports are closed. What's working today is the DNA, the data, the networks and the artificial intelligence that are getting us connected. In addition to fiscal inf infrastructure, and you need to have super fast internet connectivity. Common sense from the past, and this is my worry, that in times of crisis, there are tendencies for people to say, well, let's close everything, Let's throw the uh, baby with the bath water. No, you need to keep the baby, please. Bath water needs to be changed. The whole management system may be challenged as well. Next. And we have a great guru of the management with us, uh, Dr. Sadiq, uh, who can really tell us something about that. Next, please. Okay. G20, just coming out from them. I will not take time on that because I'm happy that whatever we are saying have been said, but these are the guys who are not just saying. These are the guys who have to take actions, the G20. The, um, those are the guys who are responsible for more than 85% of the global economy. And with their observers like the UN system, IMF, World Bank, WHO, they said the following, protect lives, thank you so much, means do your best, safeguard people, jobs and incomes, through all of what we talked about, social protection, support, bailing out, restore confidence and preserve financial stability, because you need a financial sector to support you in the future, Minimize disruptions to trade and global supply chains. And actually before that, when I, I talk about finance, the financial sector is all about two things here today. It's about many things normally, but what we need from the financial sector is to, key, to keep the payment system running. Keep the payment system running because you need the cash for the essentials and for other um, uh, um, uh, purchases of goods and services. And you need to be flexible when it comes to credit and loans and debt management. 
This is what we need from the financial sector. Minimize disruptions to trade and uh, um, global supply chain. Uh, Dr. Sadek, before the discussion, said, well, you had in one of your articles something about, about that people need really to keep distance for health reasons, but goods and services need to be very much close in order to keep the global uh, supply chain, especially for the health system, uh, running. Then you need to provide help to all countries in need of assistance. Yes, many vulnerable countries, they need uh, debt forgiveness. They, did, uh, they need uh, perhaps debt restructuring, debt relief. Case by case, we need to deal with that. And we need to coordinate on public health and financial measures to support the, the health sector. I'm happy that whatever came out today is just being prepared as well by us yesterday. Um, uh, I, but it's not just the say, it's the do now, it's the work, it's the actions. Next. I'm waiting for the following slide to move. Yeah. Yes. Here I'm giving you this uh, to think. This global crisis has two current and future dynamics. This is a crisis that will have, it's like what you say before Second World War and after Second World War, like we said in politics before the collapse of the Berlin Wall and after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, before the 2008 crisis and after this one, is, it has its before and after. And it will have two dynamics. It will have a revealing uh, one, um, uh, revealing the weakness and strength of the system. You will be discovering many things um, that are good and bad in the systems of economy and, and social uh, network and social fabric in your family uh, networks in the way that you were uh, dealing with life. My good professor, Dr. Good Abdul Khaliq, yesterday, in reaction to one of my articles, he said something. It's about, it's about all of these levels of, of discussion that when you are thinking, imagine all of these millions and millions of people locked at their homes, they have more time for themselves and for their families. They will be really rethinking many things about how they divided their life between work and uh, social um, uh, activities, uh, sport, how they balance their life um, in the past. What are they thinking about themselves, about their society, about, about their creator? All of that kind of thinking will be there. Uh, some of the thinking will be very positive. And, that, and I'm warning myself and, and I'm sharing uh, that with you, that some of the thinking will be very negative as well. Then you have creativity. Uh, many people will come up with many ideas. Um, you check how many apps are being uh, produced during the last uh, few days, how many solutions that were there looking for an opportunity. Uh, people are started to be more uh, innovative as they should. And there are some good ideas and there are some very bad ideas, as always. We hope that the good ideas will prevail. prevail. Next, please. Yeah, this is for thinking as well. Um, and the, um, and the, and the FP or the Foreign Policy Magazine, I encourage you to have a look at this uh, article about how the world will look after the coronavirus pandemic. I remember when I was at a lecture at the Faculty of Economics and Political Science in uh, 2017, um, I shared something about the shifting of the global economic gravity. That is based on some uh, update by McKinsey, but the original model came from uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School uh, Dean, um, uh, my good friend Danny Kwa. He used to be at the London School of Economics, and he has a model that has been testing where is the center of economic gravity is there. If the world is like that, for instance, and this is your east and this is your west. So there had been a shift from the west to the east during the years. From the 1950s, economic activities were very much for the advanced economies. Now you can see the shift thanks to the growth in China, India, Japan is in the East, Korea is in the East, Vietnam is in the East, Philippines, Indonesia, all of these countries, Singapore, um, um, even smaller uh, economies uh, in the past, Cambodia, um, the Philippines, this uh, ASEAN um, uh, or ASEAN, ASEAN um, uh, group um, um, and their reflections on or their impact on the economy and uh, trade is huge. So this is the world. And this kind of change, um, 
has its own geopolitical um, implications, has its own thinking. You, many of you are students. You will be thinking, should I be um, only connected to the West to study or to the East because the opportunities are there? My, my, my view uh, to everybody, including to uh, my daughter who didn't listen to me, um, uh, that it's better, I have been saying that for since 2004, um, uh, with Mahmoud uh, Saad, the uh, famous TV anchor, I was with him, I said, well, um, if, if, you, if you can, please, um, we need to teach our children, we need to teach our children, um, uh, Asian, um, Mandarin, and, and, uh, and other uh, Asian Eastern languages. Next, please. This is the new world, my friends. This is just an assumption, I might be wrong. But I've been saying that for many years. I might be wrong for many years as well. Now, this is the framework. Many of you are advisors to government. Everything needs to have an institution, needs to have public policy. Yes, it will be a different world, but some of the old ways of doing things um, are continuing with us. I was watching, and many of you may have watched this uh, um, uh, video by this Italian lady talking about many things about her anger and blaming to uh, some uh, European countries not helping them. But she listed many things about the contribution of the European um, um, to the European uh, system from the uh, Roman Empire. And you can say the same about uh, the contribution of uh, the old Egyptians to mathematics and science. Some, some things remain even with these kind of crises over time. You need to be careful not to throw institutions, not to throw, not to throw the uh, good policy um, formulation out. Um, uh, you need to put that all on a public policy framework. Data is important. Implementation will be more requiring uh, support from digitalization and finance really matters, as I've been telling my students since 1995. Finance matters. Next, please. Public and private, not just the private finance. Next. It is getting slow. Ah, yeah. So when I told you about winners and losers, this is uh, coming from um, the regulation that came yesterday uh, from uh, the Washington DC uh, authorities, telling about us about who should open and who should stay. So it gives us um, a list. It is hard for me to see it here. I'll uh, check it in the, uh, forgive me, um, on my mobile, uh, if it works, uh, here. Um, so these are the areas that are going to be uh, closed. What must close? Gyms, health clubs, spas, um, hair salons, retail clothing stores, theaters, uh, tour guides, restaurants, cafes, all of that will be closed. Um, what should open? Hospitals. These are winners. Clinics. Winners, but under pressure. Clinics, dentists, pharmacies, um, um, banks and credit unions, uh, bicycle sales, childcare facilities, grocery stores, supermarkets, all of that has to be open. So these are some activities that are going to be there. My assumption um, in the future, these are of course emergency opening and closure. So these are the current losers and winners uh, from system. Some of them are struggling, like the brave and everybody really need to acknowledge um, with appreciation the great work of the health system. The doctors, the nurses, their support, they are doing a fantastic um, uh, job today under harsh conditions and uh, they are very brave people and they need really all of the moral support uh, from our side. Um, but in the future, I say digitalization is a winner. Localization is a winner. If you can really do many things at the community level, that will be a winner. And uh, many things related to the health and the health sector. And you will innovate more. Next, please. Yeah. I think the, the next is just thanking you for your patience and apologies that I took more than planned. I left you with some references here you can use in Arabic and English. Um, you can check some of them on my page on LinkedIn. And thank you. Back to you.
Dr. Sadiq, Hisham Sadiq. Thank you. Dear Dr. Mahmoud, actually, uh, this was uh, was a quite phenomenal and fantastic presentation. Uh, we will uh, we will continue uh, as we go ahead because there's a lot of people I'm sure that they really want to uh, want to ask questions. Uh, what what I did, Dr. Mahmoud, is that we have the preset questions. Uh, they were um, more than. Uh, uh, 56 questions. We got them down to 16 because we consolidated them. And then uh, while you were doing your presentation, I did two things. I took note of what you were saying and presented some slides to show the outcomes. And also, uh, I looked at the questions that came from the Q&A. There were over 156 questions. And I took the ones that are not repetitive from the present question. So let's start with the patient questions that came over the net. Some of you, some of them you have answered, but nevertheless, I will, uh, I will cover them. I just want to tell everybody that is involved that uh, not all your questions uh, will be answered. So, so do not really feel uh, that we are just, uh, we're just not uh, making, uh, taking it seriously. But the issue here is that uh, we need to make sure that uh, we, we, we put everything in the time that uh, we can use for, for Dr. Uh, Mahmoud. First question was, according to the MIF, a recession as bad as the global financial is expected. How real do you think is the risk in general and for Egypt in particular? Uh, the question will be will be in front of you at all times, Dr. Mahmoud. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I take them one by one, or I group them. Uh, uh, well, I, you want to take them one by one because I, I we've already filtered them and consolidated them, so there is no duplication in these questions. Okay. So do you want to do you want to answer them one by one, or shall I show them to you all? Uh, you are the manager of the whole thing, so take okay. Me. Then take we'll take them one one by one, sir. Go ahead. Okay. Right. So I, I, I refer to that uh, briefly in the discussion that um, the slowdown is happening as we speak. Uh, in my article, I said recession is there globally, globally. It's only waiting for official declaration for this uh, period. As you know, reports um, uh, always lag behind the actual activities. And this may change as well in the future. This is one of the things that I might be expecting um, uh, to change in, uh, in the future. Um, okay. In the case of Egypt, I followed what came out uh, yeah, today, actually, from the Ministry of, uh, of Planning about revising their, uh, their projections down. Um, and here, um, I like really to, uh, um, to do the following. It's early really to project, and I've seen how, how, uh, how difficult it is uh, to project in normal circumstances um, and then to see the impact. But what I like to see is basically to use the science and art of economic policy. If recession is happening, if slow growth is happening, and it will have an impact on employment negatively, so um, um, what we need to do is basically take all of the measures that can sustain those who are working today to, uh, um, uh, for them to resume work as soon as the administrative controls are lifted when the health situation gives us the signal that it is good to do that. And then we need really to see, because some countries had mastered, had mastered the, the, the art, not just the science, the art of coming back fast, which are basically the Asian countries, uh, countries that, like si Singapore, with the ability to bounce back. What you do in the times of difficulty is basically to prepare for the time of uh, recovery and progress. So it's not, yes, uh, growth is going to be lower, not um, in one country, across the board. Very few countries can really declare 
um, uh, victory out of that. And there is no opportunism, op um, uh, opportunistic um, uh, op um, approaches here uh, because the damage um, uh, when it comes to this kind of a big scale across the board, it is very um, hard to say, well, it's a zero sum game, your loss is my game. It will not really work like that. However, there could be in the midterm some, some opportunities. People are challenging the system of the global value chain. Some of the industries might really be interested in moving their locations from one or two main locations into others. There will be more diversification of the locations of work. And I would say here that this kind of diversification um, needs not really to be done in the global system alone, but it requires as well some good attention to be given to what we are doing at the country level. So what we have seen that each governorate today, for instance, in Egypt is required to do some specific actions. So issues related to localization here is very much needed. I said that in the normal days, I'm saying today in the abnormal ones, that you need to unleash the potential of your capacity to engage. You have 27 governorates with different comparative advantages. Unleash their potential, lands for uh, production, um, uh, investment um, uh, centers, um, uh, localizing basic services, health, education, um, uh, even at high university uh, level. A, cunt, a country like Korea, which is half of the number of, uh, the, uh, of the people in Egypt, less than half actually, have more than 400 universities. In your case, in our case, we need to have in this um, 800 universities, they will be located almost everywhere. But this needs really to be new ways of delivering. Digitalization will be the solution. And this can really help us going forward because the cost of delivery will be, will be um, uh, different and the association with some of the big names will be available. So many things could really happen from the infrastructure to the investment, to the way that we handle human capital, to the kind of spending and the recovery. Normally in the days of recovery, there is a catching up. So there, there could be some sort of fast um, recovery based on, on the health situation. It's all about the health sector now. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud, because actually, you covered the number of questions, uh, you answered the number of questions that are coming up. Uh, one second, sorry. Okay, one of the other questions is that, uh, do you think that uh, the common enemy COVID scenario will have an impact on the trust between the countries and business? And they may overlook their previous differences in the past. Uh, well, it's a, it's a very important and tricky question. I cannot really, yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the fact that the G20 today came up with a communique. And the past you have seen even in the, at the G7, the group of the uh, high industrialized countries of the past, because some of them are not that industrialized anymore. In one of their meetings, they even failed to produce a communique. At least today, in front of all of you, there is two and a half pages of a communique um, about priorities, about that we are working together, we are going to coordinate, we are going to cooperate, we are not going to be indulging into any kind of tensions and all of that. This is very important. I hope it will last and it, I hope it will be applied. And as I said, in these times, there will be different thinking of different, in different ways of handling matters. There could be some sort of um, thinking about the, that has political implications. There could be a rise of the far right. There could be a rise of the far left. There could be many things. So one cannot really just, um, um, uh, say that this will be the outcome um, eventually, but at least in the, in the short term, until lives are saved, health system is restored, um, economy is going back to the way that gets back the people to work and get busy, um, we hope to have the cooperative system in place. The UN Secretary General for many years have been saying that we are suffering from a deficit in trust. Economists and uh, finance people like myself would always talk about deficits and balance of payments or in budgets or in balance, balance sheets and balances. But uh, he was talking about the, uh, the other kind of deficit that is the mother and the cause of all of the other deficits, which is 
causing all of these trade tensions, trade wars, uh, obstacles to investment, obstacles to the movement of people from a place to the other. Now I hope, now I hope that we can do a better job going forward. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, the third question was, as the whole world is in, a, is in a pause mode now and virtually lifestyle, what do you foresee as the impact of the future of business, supply chains, travel, tourism, education, retails, and other things? Right. Um, I think I tackled this, uh, this question. Um, um, I think we need to distinguish here in three time uh, periods. Um, um, the immediate impact, we see that uh, on tourism, no tourism. Travel, no travel. Education is moving digital um, uh, partially for the half of those who are learning today. Retail, some of that is working, the, 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 uh, the, the home delivery and all. And some, if you go not very far from what I, where I am here, like six miles away, I saw uh, signs of 80 and 90% of discounts on some of the products uh, because they are not essential today. Um, but this may change in, in the future. Supply Thank chains, you. I mentioned something about the short term, mid term, I think I'm, I'm seeing more diversification in the, in the units of engagement in the global uh, supply chain. Thank you, sir. Uh, some fear a recession in the global economy. How bad, uh, which what this gentleman called it, the COVID-19 recession. He was saying how bad a COVID-19 recession would be. What are the scenarios for growth and recovery? He mentioned something uh, likely a recovery path. Yeah. And whether there would be any lasting structural impact from the unfolding uh, crisis. Right. I, I mentioned that briefly. So um, the economists talk about uh, the uh, V-shaped um, kind of uh, recovery. That is not happening. I'm not seeing that. Uh, we saw the steep um, uh, fall. We, we are not seeing the, uh, the quick uh, recovery measures yet. So we hope that the recovery will be following a path like a U. Um, um, and we need to avoid by every possible way, through good measures, tackled in, um, in, in a kind of a very focused approach, um, avoiding an L-shaped kind of a path uh, for, uh, for growth. Thank you, sir. Uh, one more. Uh, what the entire world is currently passing through seems worse than the 2008 recession. How will this affect your work for finance in the 2030 agenda? Right, it's, uh, it's everybody's work. And um, the, uh, I agree with the first part, 2008 recession is nothing. Um, uh, compared to what we are seeing today. And actually, the, what's all the SDGs, the 2030 agenda, is part of the recovery. Um, um, uh, check again that slide of the nine points. It's all about solutions. And actually, um, the experts in that World at Risk report say that what we're, whatever we're in today in the health is basically because of negligence and um, uh, not prioritizing um, SDG three, the uh, Sustainable Development Goal uh, number uh, three, which is on health. I would say the same about education quality, SDG four. Um, I w I'm worried about SDG one, uh, extreme poverty. So actually, this this uh, kind of a crisis will really put for the countries that are taking matters seriously all of the issues related to the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, more seriously. I think there is a kind of a general misunderstanding uh, that the SDGs are long term, SDGs are 2030. That means that we need to wait until 29. This is very wrong. You, many of you are students and uh, experts in the field. You want to have an MBA. If you were thinking to have an MBA like um, uh, 10 years ago when you are in, a, in your secondary school, that doesn't mean that you don't do your secondary school or your university and then you do your, uh, your MBA. That, that requires action on every day, day by day, until you get the first degree, second degree, and this high degree. So I think, um, and this was the problem as well on the MDG style, when we had, 
when we had this kind of the Millennium Development Goals and they were neglected. Uh, I think it could be a very strong uh, warning alarm that we need to take very, very seriously. Thank you, Doctor. Um, the question number six, after Corona diseases is contained, what is the grace period the World Bank would allow countries to postpone paying their loan installment? Well, I refer you here to the, um, to the two um, reports or the two announcements. Um, uh, the joint announcement between the IMF and the World Bank yesterday came out yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, no, um, yeah, the day before yesterday it came out. Um, um, about the, uh, the arrangements for uh, debt relief and moratorium. Um, and today in the G20, there are calls for uh, um, handling matters related to, uh, to debt. The UN Secretary General um, used a stronger uh, term, um, uh, which um, I'm happy with um, in this circumstance, that we need to consider debt restructuring because it requires this kind of uh, good uh, arrangement and flexibility based on the country, that each country you go and say, well, here is your condition, some people need interest rate forgiveness. Some people would need only some postponement of, uh, um, of, uh, of part of the repayments. Um, um, and some others may, may need more than that. Next. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, with the current uh, COVID-19 crisis cause a severe downturn to the Egyptian economy, and to what extent how, and how can we mitigate these implications and what be the role of financial institution? I think I, I answered the majority yeah, of this question. This. The role of the financial institution, just a reminder of that. There was a very important comprehensive financial sector reform that helped the country for many years. I was happy to be part of the team which designed this one, uh, along with the central bank and the government. Then. 2004, 2008 was very much important. And that helped us to go and navigate through the financial crisis 2008. It helped the economy and the financial system to uh, deal with all of the shocks that political, geopolitical, economic, uh, uh, for many years. Then another reform program the country started in 2016. That is very solid program, and we hope it will continue in the positive uh, uh, parts of it. Um, what, what is needed now um, is for the financial sector to continue doing its good work on the bank and the non-banking side. I saw very good initiatives by the central bank, by the uh, capital market uh, um, participants, by the financial regulatory authorities. Um, I, I saw as well good initiatives uh, to support the, um, uh, the economy at large, which announced by the president. Um, the, 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 the issue here that I like to emphasize is basically we need to use the sophistication of the financial sector to help in implementing the universal health coverage because that would need some good insurance business, some good um, uh, business in terms of facilitation and services support. Um, uh, that would require as well very sophisticated digitalized system for universal uh, income. And this is the main outcome. If you are telling me how can you convince the private sector in the future um, uh, and the entrepreneurs and those who want to work on their own, they need really to be protected and they need to be protected through what I just mentioned, investment in public services, education, health and transport and basic other services. Imagine if you have a decent public schooling for your kids. Imagine that you have good health service for yourselves, for your family and your parents. Imagine that you have good public uh, uh, sector transport support. If these sectors are there, imagine as well what kind of savings you are going to be making yeah. of your income for other matters. In addition to that, I'm saying please introduce, please, please introduce a workable solution, not for the conditional cash transfers, which, is fan, uh, which are fantastic, not the Takaful and, Kar and Karama, which are great alone, Please consider universal income for all, and that could really be done in a good way through a good social security system managed by the Ministry of Finance and the other relevant ministries. Thank you, sir. Uh, one of that, what is the impact of uh, coronavirus crisis on the multinational tycoons like uh, Amazon, McDonald's, Microsoft, 
and how should they deal with the aftermath in terms of losses, profits, and market share? Well, um, uh, I would not really put McDonald's with the um, with the high tech um, gurus and players in the market. It's a big name um, in some places, but you can check the top ten uh, companies uh, around the world today. They are all. Um, the ones who are into uh, technology, into uh, logistics, uh, supported by technology. Um, and I think they, uh, they are going uh, to win eventually out of, uh, of this crisis. Um, we are all using their uh, products now to communicate while you are social uh, distancing physically. We cannot, but to do more um, use of that. I think um, if you leave them to their own, yes, there could be some sort of uh, respon um, uh, corporate responsibility on their side, ethical uh, motivations, uh, self-interest even to, for them mm -hmm. to, uh, to be good. But I think uh, issues related to cooperation and um, across the countries, being subject to effective um, um, uh, and useful regulations. Uh, and we saw some response from these uh, companies uh, recently. They were pushing against any kind of regulations affecting whatever is published in their, in their platform. And then when people start to get personally harmed because of fake news um, or um, um, uh, wrong information, um, uh, um, people are talking about uh, pandemics and uh, infodemics as well. Infodemics as um, uh, bad information that could uh, expose your health or my health to something wrong. If I read something and you say somebody is fabricating um, a, um, an announcement by the WHO and people now in the uh, in the photoshopping and uh, uh, in the Photoshop techniques and the video shop technique can can make many things, um, uh, and they can really put some wrong information that it is safe to 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 take something. Uh, you and I and and uh, especially through WhatsApp, um, uh, which I I mainly use. Um, uh, there are many things that are being shared that you need to filter. So those guys started to um, um, to be uh, more responsive when it comes to uh, responsible um, 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 uh, promotion of ideas. Um, that may change uh, to the better, uh, I hope. Making profits, profits are going to be subject to taxes. So I'm never worried about uh, profits as far as there is a good tax system and a good um, public spending out of that. Let people make profits, tax them when they reach the, the level. It's, um, it's the way of doing things. Uh, you cannot ban people from making profits. As far as it's from a good cause, no abuse, no uh, monopolistic practices, and um, uh, no uh, profiteering. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, is there any international uh, treaties that uh, mandates sharing the medicine of corona in case it was successfully developed by any country or any corporate? I'm, um, I'm, I'm not an expert in, um, in the uh, international law in this area. Um, uh, perhaps some, um, some of our participants are more familiar with that. But what I know that in the time of emergency and under public pressure, we have the precedence for um, uh, Ebola, we have the pre precedence for AIDS, and that's why UN AIDS was created to uh, avail the, uh, the the preventive measures and the uh, protective uh, medicine, and, and the protective measures and the medicine and the cure. Um, uh, in the Ebola crisis as well, there was some good availability of uh, of the medicine. It's an actually it's in the self interest of everybody, not for you to be healthy but for everybody to be healthy. So the issue of global public good prevails. WHO will have the power to, uh, to implement it. If there is uh, going to be cost for production, uh, the pharmaceutical industries uh, uh, promise that they can do it as fast as possible. If, uh, if there is going to be any uh, kind of uh, support, philanthropists can intervene uh, by availing the medicine in the low income countries. There should be a whole of government approach. And I think um, the four pillars that I shared with the WHO had this issue of access, inclusion, make it affordable. And that is based on their mandate to do that. So 
and I, I'm not uh, worried if there is a development of a medicine to reach the people if all of these promises are going to be operationalized. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahmoud. And it's not just about the law, because there some sort of agreement might be there. It's basically about how to apply it. Yeah. Uh, can this crisis change, change the dependency of countries on each other? Yeah. Uh, well, I mentioned something um, in, um, in my presentation about um, ways of dealing with the current arrangements of trade, investment, and the global value chain. That will, that will change. And uh, what I hope is going to be changing for the better. What we hope, as I put in my last article, that what we hope is for a just society, a more just society, more equitable, more inclusive, and we need a more efficient economic system that covers trade investment and our, um, um, our engagement in the economy. And I hope that we're learning from this crisis. Okay. After uh, COVID-19, what pillars should the emergency response plan include for speed recovery to airlines? Uh, this was somebody from the airlines who was worried about the airlines specifically and the impact on that on the airlines. But as you said, sir, uh, there are many measures. And actually in the G20, there are measures to protect the essential industry. That world cannot move without airlines. We Thank cannot. You. I think um, I'm speculating here. So it's just it's my personal opinion that when the time is going to be um, put under control, the, that disease in, um, uh, more flexibility is going to be shown to essential travel, essential travel uh, across border. Um, and then the, the system will open up uh, gradually. But it's all about this good moment for WHO to tell me three things. That the uh, pandemic is under control. It's not a pandemic anymore. There is still health risk and hazards, but it could be put under control. Second, that there is a, a vaccine that is tested and it could be produced. Third, that we reached a kind of a flat um, um, uh, stage in that uh, curve, that, uh, that the curve is flattened so people will be relaxed. And they are today in China celebrating. In Korea, the life is moving on. Singapore. The, uh, is, is, is in the same uh, condition. I heard, I haven't seen evidence uh, about Taiwan as well. Thank you, sir. Uh, if the value of the dollar decreases, what will be the consequences? Will this generate opportunities for investment and exploration in Egypt? What they mean of exploration here, they mean in the oil business, sir. Here, um, I, I go to the, to the couple of points that I mentioned about um, um, a whole of government, a whole of society approach in dealing with matters. It's not here about exchange rate policy alone, interest rate policy alone, fiscal policy in isolation, social policy alone. Uh, we take it, generally speaking, I'm not talking about a specific country here. For the countries, there are two conditions here. For the countries that are following flexible exchange rate systems, they need to show flexibility in this case. And that kind of flexibility could be under the managed rules of flexibility. It's not chaos, it's flexibility. And then what we are talking about in the cases of countries that are pegging their currencies, the countries pegging their currencies to the euro, very few today, or the dollar, very many of them, or to a basket, which is a going to be a growing case in the future, um, not now, not in the time of uh, the emergency. I think they need to, need to show uh, that they are applying the rules of what they declared, um, because different countries with different systems. Thank you, doctor. Um, how wise is it but, for uh, but, but again, on the, so, yes, sorry, sir, go doctor, ahead. Sir. But on, on, the, on the investment, um, the investment is determined not just by the exchange rate. It, uh, it has many, many determinants, as you know. Uh, uh, the clarity of the exchange rate policy is one of them. OK. Uh, how wise is it for the CB, CBE's procedures to lower the interest rate and delay repayment of all credit. Is it wise to remedy this by offering high interest certificates? Well, the, um, um, this is a specific question on the central banking um, management. Um, countries around the world uh, cut interest rates. Um, 
made some sort of extensions um, uh, for, um, uh, for credit arrangements and repayments. Um, I'm, I'm much more interested in the two lines that I mentioned. Um, is the payment system intact? I, I see it intact, it's functioning. Are there arrangements for deferring um, the, the uh, repayments, making um, loan repayments easy on the people? That could be um, uh, seen as a good thing as well. The rest for me in the times of crises could be really um, seen as emergency measures that could really be revised um, uh, when the time comes. Different countries react differently in, in these times. Thank you, Doctor. How Egyptian, how Egyptian government can exploit the global crisis and turn it into opportunities? Can this be done, sir? Well, first, first, first action is to keep the health system uh, with the adequate support. And that would be the best opportunity of learning from whatever is happening around the world is to take the health se sector um, seriously, not just in the emergency, but the emergency and beyond. The second one is basically learning from this kind of a crisis about how to protect the people, not just the businesses. And that will get us into a completely different paradigm when it comes to social protection and support to the general public. The third is basically about how to allocate investment and how to prioritize our public spending and private sector and partnership with communities. The three need to work together. So if, if these conditions are going to be uh, exploited, I think it's, uh, it, it's not just a global crisis. It's a global crisis. It's a national crisis. It's a regional crisis. It's a, it's a community crisis as well. Um, it's good that we are um, uh, taking that in a good way of handling it, but it's a crisis. So it's not just taking the opportunity from the global crisis. Thank you, Doctor. Um, what is your takeaway capsule and advice to the Egyptian startups and investors to deal with, an over, with the overcome of the global crisis? It's a great opportunity, especially the ones who are an innovation on um, uh, good uh, digital solutions and uh, community support, dealing with essential uh, products and services for their communities. Um, I think we can really even flourish more when the time comes because some of these solutions are going to be uh, growing um, uh, with more demand in the future. So they need to invest better in their ideas. I, uh, I do think that in addition to, the, to, uh, to all of these innovations and risk taking and all that, um, one needs really, and that was basically my advice when I was taught, asked about the future of economy and business under the fourth industrial revolution and what's called the gig economy. Said, so well, it's fantastic when it gives all of these people the different opportunities to work in different platforms. You are providing support to an application, you are driving an Uber car, but um, you are very busy one day and then you are suddenly out of business. So you need really to have some sort of a good social protection uh, for um, the tough days. Think about that as well. What is the impact of coronavirus crisis on the multinational tycoon? Okay, this has been covered before. Yes. Now, these are may, the may, 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 I ask, may I ask you, doctor, perhaps, because the, the, uh, there is another engagement for me in like in three minutes, and they, they called me like four times. Uh, I know I took more of, um, of the time allocated to me, but if, uh, if there are some questions that you'd like to share with me or um, uh, anybody want to ask any, uh, any, wants to ask any question, Okay. So perhaps we can wrap it up I, like in three minutes because those, okay. those can you, guys okay. are calling I, I'll, I'll, I'll just let you know, sir, uh, these are the questions that were that came from the uh, webinar at attendees. They're talking about after the G20 summit uh, today, are the decisions taken going to make a difference yes. in stopping? Okay. Uh, do you think there are only four or five questions because okay. we consult, consolidated them all. Do you sure. think that uh, decreasing the price of petroleum would be a wrong decision? Okay. What kind of measures small or medium enterprises can take uh, to minimize the losses and risks? Okay. Will, will, uh, will we be announcing the failure of global operation in its current shape? Okay. And, yes, sir. And and after uh, after, after overcoming the crisis, will we see fundamental changes 
and the way of managing crisis. And you think the whole world will focus on natural resources, especially in Africa. These are the six questions out of uh, more than 230 questions, but consolidated because most of them were covered from the pre, uh, pre-answered ones. Well, I'm, hap- I'm happy to receive the rest. Already I've taken many notes about many questions um, that I like as well to, uh, to learn how to answer them in, uh, in the future, or, or at least learn the, uh, their, uh, their good answers from others. Okay. About the, the, the whole world doing something like um, focusing on natural resources in Africa, I think Africa offers more than natural resources. And yes, uh, natural resources became very cheap, uh, there could be some opportunities uh, f- uh, on that as well, but uh, the volatility in, natu- in some of the natural resources may discourage some of the investments. But uh, Africa is offering more than that today. If you go to some countries like uh, Rwanda, like Kenya, like Ghana, there are some many good uh, um, opportunities for investment in impact uh, investing as well in areas related to g- digitalization, um, uh, solutions based on the fourth industrial revolution. After this crisis, many um, uh, big investments had, had to be allocated in different places. I, I would bet that many of the African countries, and uh, not just sub-Saharan Africa, but in the north as well, are going to be competing for them to be regional hubs. So there will be many opportunities there. Okay, uh, Mahmoud, to, um, I, need just, I just need two minutes to wrap up. Uh, you had something else to say, sir? I'm sorry, I apologize. Okay. So okay. I, I reached the, uh, I started with that question, but I think the rest of the questions, as good as they are, they were answered um, uh, directly yes. Or, yes, sure. or, or, in, uh, or indirectly. I'm happy to take them um, offline uh, through my LinkedIn yeah, account. We will do that, sir. We, we will do yeah. that. Uh, the Thank outcome, uh, the major outcome of, the, uh, of, the, of, uh, of this web, web, webinar is the global crisis, that three combined crises, health, economic, and financial market crisis. They have to provide the effective treatment without the, the, the discrimination, and it has to be properly under control. The priority should be used for private uh, health, and everybody should be in, in, involved. Uh, while it is imperative, this is this we talked about it, sir, regarding the, uh, uh, the African countries, it is important, the, the importance of the outcome of the G20 meeting in Saudi, uh, and you mentioned a number of things about them. We should not listen to any uh, type of vaccines unless it is stated by the uh, World Health Health Organization. We should be investing in capital, resilience, and infrastructure. Of course, there are much more other things, sir, but this is the main points that were uh, mentioned. And uh, the future is shifting the center of gravity of the world economy towards Asia. Uh, The one plus nine solutions, these are the nine points that you mentioned, sir, quite quite, uh, clearly. And these are the things, this is the, uh, the real thing to get us out of this global crisis. Now, one last thing, uh, doctor, I would like to tell you. Um, I'd just like to thank uh, the webinar attendees on behalf of Sleska. Uh, I would like to thank uh, you for joining into our first uh, webinar, and especially uh, with such an honorary guest speaker, just like Dr. Uh, Mahmoud uh, Mohideen. Um, I wanted also uh, to say that in respect of everybody, I would like very much that uh, we, would review, we will review all the questions, consolidate them, and send replies to all of them. Uh, we will do it surely between our office and your, uh, Sleska and your office, doctor. Uh, and they all, most of them requested the copy of the presentation. Now, for you, Dr. Mahmoud, Words cannot be enough to express our appreciation and gratitude for such an outstanding webinar, where you have flourished our minds with such updated information, giving us a futuristic view, as well as a prescription in the form of the one plus nine solution that you gave us, and how to improve the exit and good recovery from these crises. I thank you very much, sir. Thank you all again. And please stay safe and healthy. God bless Egypt as well as the entire world. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I share with you um, uh, the good uh, prayer and the good hope for Egypt and for all of the world. It has been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Good night.